I'm Marvin Sparn. Born and raised in Denver, Colorado. Third generation native of Denver, Colorado. My mother and grandmother were both born and raised in Denver. Went to the Colorado School of Mines out of high school and my early direction was in the chemistry of hydrocarbons. And the closest thing you could come to in the chemistry of hydrocarbons was petroleum refining at the Colorado School of Mines. This Colorado School of Mines is uh, a challenge to say the very least. Had professors that uh, had absolutely no hangups about failing an entire class. Just never heard of a curve and never accepted the idea that maybe they didn't get the message across in the classroom. And the Korean conflict came along and went to Fort Leonard Wood uh, for basic training and then uh, got on the cadre there and uh, one of the primary uh, projects for me was teaching demolition, which was kind of the opposite of where I ended up. And Fort Custer, Michigan is as far east as you can go in the 5th Army area, and that's where I was assigned. But before I got to Fort Custer, Michigan, uh, I was advised that uh, the anti-aircraft units from there had been deployed to Chicago. So I lived in a tent in Chicago for quite some time. Uh, in the process of doing this, we were trying to develop more permanent facilities in Chicago for the number of people that we had there. And uh, I got involved with the Civi uh, Civilian Corps of Engineers office in Chicago. And uh, uh, was, we were doing mess halls and, and shower facilities and what have you, because we had none of that, just tents. And uh, that uh, got me involved in the construction world. Ended up getting Bachelor of Science Architectural Engineering in 1957 and Bachelor of Architecture degree in 1959. Bounced around to several firms and at that particular time, the suggestion from the professionals was that uh, you uh, work in multiple firms just to experience the differences to the approach to the world of architecture. And uh, so I did. I worked several different firms and uh, then decided I was going to branch out on my own. And that turned out to be a, a bit of a challenge, but it also turned out to be very interesting because there were quite a few sole proprietors around and uh, I joint ventured with some of them to do projects that were of larger size. The one that I refer to most frequently because I never expected to outlive anything that I worked on was Crossroads of Vale. And uh, Harold Carver and I joint ventured to do that project and uh, then uh, the philosophy of Vale Village changed and instead of everything focusing on the center of the village, they've changed and said we want to attract people and I'm sure that the folks going down I-70 at 70 miles an hour are going to pay attention to the fact that the building was torn down and the door is now on the highway side rather than on the village side, but so be it. In the overall, it's been a, a terrific experience. I uh, was invited to be a guest lecturer at CU, uh, teaching a class in building construction. Maintained uh, an interest in being involved with the students, and uh, uh, that uh, that part of it was was very rewarding. I enjoyed uh, working with people and. Uh, the, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, uh, work at CU uh, was a, a very interesting situation in that particular instance in that 
that uh, a good friend of mine, was a fellow by the name of Jim Chin, who was a professor of engineering uh, at CU. And I'd known him, I'd known his family, and we, and uh, out of the clear blue, he called me and said, I, I think you should come to, to talk to the dean about being a guest lecturer. And uh, my immediate reaction was, I'm not a teacher. That's not what I do. And he talked, and the dean talked, and they promised me all kinds of things. Oh, I probably have 30, 35 students, and I could pick any text I wanted to pick, and I could teach it any way I wanted to teach it. And, and uh, I uh, finally said, OK, I'll do it. And I show up for the first day of class, and I have a lecture hall that will seat 150, and there was standing room only. And I went back to the dean's office and said, that doesn't look like 30 to 35 students to me. Turned out to be a great experience. I was supposed to do it for one semester. I did it for five years. And uh, went through the same exercise year after year after year. And uh, the rumor around the College of Engineering was that I was a, a patsy professor and people were coming from all over the state because it was an easy way to get a grade. While I was at CU, I uh, uh, came to the conclusion, some way, somehow, that uh, the, the architects as a profession needed to work together and be represented uh, in the overall process. And so I got involved in the student, at that thing was called student chapters of the AIA. And I uh, was president of the student chapter. Uh, they had an annual meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, there's a thing floating around that's a bit of trivia. It's a, a picture of uh, the presidents of student chapters from all over the country at the Octagon Building, the actual Octagon Building in Washington, D.C. And uh, the, uh, the gentleman to the left of that picture was uh, a fellow that sort of developed a reputation, Philip Johnson. And just off to the right was another one called Walter Netsch. And uh, great experience. It was a, a very interesting relationship because at that time there weren't quite as many rules and regulations as there are today. And uh, I was invited to their meetings. But when their meetings went to business items, I was asked to leave. They talked about fee structures, they talked about liability, et cetera, et cetera. And this student doesn't really belong here but uh, had an excellent working relationship with them. And uh, at one point, uh, the uh, uh, student chapter was invited Frank Lloyd Wright to come lecture at CU. And uh, I uh, had the opportunity to talk personally with Mr. Wright and work out details, but the uh, university had a policy that you couldn't invite someone like that on the basis that they would be paid out of the income from the lecture. You had to pay them in advance. So my contacts through Color Society, I went door to door talking to architects, asking them to underwrite the uh, appearance of Mr. Wright. And uh, time caught up with me and I didn't get all the money collected that I would need to get Mr. Wright here. but. Uh, it was an excellent working relationship, and it continued on. It, in that same time frame, uh, Phil Jarreau, myself, a couple other people, formed the Government Affairs Committee. And that kept me very involved, and ultimately ended up president-elect of AIA Colorado, and inherited the job of uh, terminating the executive for AIA Colorado. I uh, don't know why my predecessor didn't get it done while he was in office, but anyway, uh, we hired a consultant 
that was a recommendation that uh, the individual be terminated and escorted out the door directly. Uh, when I was president-elect, the, the policy was to establish goals for your term. Well, I don't even remember what the goals were because uh, the process of terminating the exec and Yvonne and I running the office with the help of, of uh, Bo Jean Wong and Jam Wong and some of the others, uh, that turned out to be the goal of the year was just to survive. But uh, it, uh, it went very well and, and uh, actually that whole scenario has become a bit of a running joke of AIA Colorado because the past president's committee, they go around and review what everyone did and what their goals were and it always comes up and your goal was to survive. <laughs> I, I find it difficult to, to pin down a particular project. Linen Tree probably would rate high on my favorites list, but it was primarily because of the clients. They were excellent people to work with. They uh, paid their bills on time. Uh, and, it, and it just uh, was, it was such a great overall relationship, getting the building designed and and uh, working through all of the uh, remodel of the original building and so on and so forth, that uh, that certainly has to uh, rate very, very high on the list. Uh, my client in Denver, obviously, just pure longevity, and that client and I, in, in all those years, never had a crossword uh, in terms of, of uh, architectural history. He was probably the closest thing I could imagine to a patron. He hired me to look after their building. And if I suggested it should be this, that's the way it was. If it should be that, that's the way it was. I ultimately became their facilities director because I kept track of all the buildings. I had all of the information on everything that had to do with their building. So, if they needed a new boiler, or a water heater, or a roof, whatever, I had it all there. I'd put together the documents they needed and have it fixed or repaired or added to or whatever. Fortunately for me, he listened to what I had to say and he liked the way things turned out, so we kept doing project after project after project. And, and uh, his uh, wife threatened me with divorce because it was going to be a package deal. I remodeled her house probably a dozen times and she was tired of living in a construction zone and she was going to get rid of her husband and me. It's not the easiest profession to, to uh, survive in. Uh, pay scale when I got out of CU was uh, uh, borderline ridiculous and uh, it was a, a challenge to, to survive as a family and uh, yet the, the interest and the, the concept of the challenge of the world of architecture, clients with a project, problem, challenge, whatever title you want to hang on it, and trying to come up with a unique solution to that particular challenge is, is just undeniably one of the, the best things you could do with your life, I think. But, uh, you know, there are so many things you could do that are just purely repetitious. Do them over and over and over again. But uh, uh, one of the jokes that's been running around as long as I've been uh, in the, the world of architecture is pick a, an auto manufacturer and they put out millions of cars and uh, nobody particularly takes them to task if something doesn't work. But if you're an architect, there better not be any mistakes first time around. That's it. And so, uh, you know, that, that uh, has been the challenge and the interest and the, the driving force, if you will, of being in the world of architecture. Prince Charles spoke at uh, 
AIA gala many years ago and he came down like a ton of lead on the architects for not paying attention to the community in which they were putting buildings. And I think this is a challenge today. Uh, what fits and what doesn't fit. It, it's a challenge to, to try and decide what's right, what isn't. Yeah. And, uh, it, uh, but these have all come with the onset of years. I guess the, the, the thing that I would be inclined to talk to would be their ability to listen and understand what the client needs and wants. Uh, I think that uh, in the overall of the years that I've been involved, uh, I've seen too many buildings that have become monuments to the architect and did not necessarily answer the, the needs and desires of the client. And uh, I think that's unfortunate if that happens because, uh, and I, I think in particular, if that happens in residential architecture, uh, the people that are gonna live in it should have what they want. You as an architect should try and adapt that design to what they want that, and that they're very, very happy and very comfortable with what they've received as an end product. Pretty much is my career, and uh, uh, I'm happy that I got into it. Uh, I still have an interest in the chemistry of hydrocarbons, but, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it turned out to be so very, very interesting to me to uh, to approach it from that standpoint of the challenges of coming up with answers for how to do, what to do, where to do, so on and so forth, I think is, is a positive in my mind. I hope I've had positive impacts on people that I've met and worked with.